So I really dove into this like cohort of students that were not being pushed. And my goal was to create a college readiness type of environment to kind of shift their thinking. And by the end of their four years, we had a 95% college acceptance rate. So I was thrilled. And then about a 50% college retention rate. And then I was disappointed. And you either have two kind of questions that come up. And I think this was the most pivotal part of my entire career, which is, is it something I'm doing as an educator, as a school, or is there something wrong with the system? And I realized there is like both ends of the spectrum needed to be addressed and nobody was really diving into it. So I decided to start traveling the country um, on behalf of our school, working with our graduates to see what was actually happening at institutions. I'm so excited to have you on A Mother's Guide Through Autism, Alex. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Um, so you and I um, ran into it, or I actually, I ran into you because <laughs> you were at a conference, a TACA conference in California, um, and I met you, I started just briefly learning about what you do. And so I am just so excited to have you here because I think this topic that we're going to be discussing today about transitions um, for our kids on the spectrum and also with other disabilities is really important. And I get a lot of questions from the moms I coach. So um, let's get started. Would you share, um, let, let's just start with your background, share your background and how you got interested in supporting students and just a little bit about your story. Sure. So um, I think I always wanted to be a teacher. I think that was really important. And then obviously, as I was getting older, my very great pushy mother wanted me to become a lawyer. Um, so I spent a little bit of time interning at family court systems, thinking that's the route I was going to go. And while I was waiting to figure out what law school I was going to go to, my career advisor and my undergraduate degree told me about an internship possibility at a private school for students with nonverbal learning disabilities, Asperger syndrome, PDD-NOS. Um, so this is obviously before the DSM-5 came out throwing out those diagnoses. And I went to the school and completely fell in love. It was, you know, I had a, an undergraduate in history, so I wasn't a trained teacher, but I thought it was such a unique mission to have a college preparatory school for students on the spectrum. And it was such a challenging mission and such an important mission that I was drawn in. So I took a job as an intern and I quickly moved up to become a department chair of history and English, and then really got into the world of social emotional support, became an assistant dean of students, and then got my um, master's degree in mental health counseling. In that kind of world, I started working with a group of young females um, that really weren't being pushed to go to college. And this was kind of still in the day where um, there wasn't a lot of research around the transition for female students on the autism spectrum, whether that's because of the rate of the diagnostics, just not a lot of um, media attention. So I really dove into this like cohort of students that were not being pushed. And my goal was to create a college readiness type of environment to kind of shift their thinking. And by the end of their four years, we had a 95% college acceptance rate. So I was thrilled. And then about a 50% college retention rate. And then I was disappointed. And you either have two kind of questions that come up. And I think this was the most pivotal part of my entire career, which is, is it something I'm doing as an educator, as a school, or is there something wrong with the system? And I realized there is like both ends of the spectrum needed to be addressed and nobody was really diving into it. So I decided to start traveling the country um, on behalf of our school, working with our graduates to see what was actually happening at institutions. I didn't want to hear from an admissions office. I didn't want to read another book. I wanted to actually go through a process with our students from accessibility services to exams. And then 
The rest is happenstance. And I came to Beacon College, the first four-year college for students who learn differently, to start all of our college readiness programs. And my mission, my vision has always been to increase retention for students who learn differently in colleges, to support families, to support students through skill-based and differentiated languaging and programming. And, you know, it's been wonderful. In the past four years at Beacon, we've worked with over 1,500 students and their families as they navigate college across the United States, no matter the institution. Wow. Wow. That is, first of all, congratulations on this work that you're doing, because on behalf of all parents, not just moms, it is, um, it means a lot to parents i know to the to the kids too but it is such a hard yes. hard road ahead um it, it, when your child starts kindergarten all the way through uh, through through high school and then so many of our schools don't have any support for the next steps right and that's why this work is great. And it, and it has to involve the family. The, the family that got me started with everything was a mom of twins with Asperger's syndrome and a more severely disabled child at home. And she was what they called the helicopter mom. And nobody wanted to work with her. And so, you know, I decided to jump in. And I realized, like, we just placed judgment a lot on parents. And I'm like, here I was in my mid-20s. I knew nothing. And I learned more from that one parent than anything. And that changed my world. I said, no longer will we use labels to describe parents. We don't know what you've been through. It's been a lot. And ever since then, all of my programming, all of Beacon's programming always involves the parent and the family because we realize a successful transition is a team effort. It cannot just be about the student. I agree 100%. Um, when I was in education, I also worked with transition programs and, you know, your, your students who are on the spectrum or have other disabilities, there is a huge gap between the parents and the teachers and it's, it's nobody's fault, right? It, it, it just is what it is. And so the parents go to the educator like, hey, you know, because our of inclusion, which thank goodness for inclusion. Um, but it doesn't seem like we are as prepared as what we could be to have conversations because I come from both a teacher mm -hmm. and parent. Sure. And so this work that you're doing um, personally, I'm just thrilled about and I would love to see it grow. Um, so that'll be another conversation, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's not talked about enough, or when it's talked about, it's way too late. You know, you shouldn't be having the transition conference at the sophomore year, junior year IEP meeting. That you are way too late in the game. And I think the more we can educate, the better off we're all going to be. Yeah. Oh, I love this. I love it. I was so excited to talk to you. Um, let's talk about uh, your navigator prep um, and what it does. Yeah. So um, I created Navigator Prep as a response to the idea that people weren't ready for college. And often colleges will start working with you during orientation or the first year experience. And what I know for most students with autism or other learning differences is that when you're front loaded with concrete information, we feel better. Mm -hmm. um, when we can make direct connections between ourselves and the next institution, we are better prepared. And I wanted to create a program that made college more concrete. So Navigator Prep is the first virtual college um, readiness program for students and families. It works with students virtually before virtual was a thing, before COVID. Um, and what we work on really is how to manage the adjustment to their next placement. The theory behind Navigator Prep is that when we adjust to a new environment, we're gonna have a response, whether it's more anxiety, more depression, substance use, um, separation anxiety, you name it. And unfortunately, colleges don't respond until it's too late, till it's a problem. So we try to figure out what's gonna cause the difficulty in adjustment, and we work through stages to make that adjustment healthier. Through Navigator Prep, whether it's in a nine-month program, a six-month program, or three-month program, 
We work with students individually in groups on self-awareness around their understanding truly their educational environment um, and the realities of college. Most students don't really know what college means. So they have this false assumption that whatever they're doing in high school is going to carry over or their great Miss Jones that was their SPED coordinator will be the same equivalency in a disabilities office. So we have to do a lot of corrective thinking. And by starting with that foundational work, we're establishing buy-in, we're establishing context to learning. Then we could start working on the harder skills, executive functioning, planning, time management, organization. Um, I like to say my biggest um, pride is when we got 71% of our students to try a new organizational system in our program. Trying to get any teenagers to organize is, is not that enjoyable. Um, yeah. But with technology now shifting away from Google Classroom to self-reliant systems is important. We then work on emotional regulation and problem solving and then self-advocacy. In all of our program, you work with a transition counselor that's a specialist in education, psychology, higher education, and the family works with that same person. And our job is really to help students connect their certain learning profile, their, their strengths and weaknesses, and how are they gonna navigate their next environment? Wow, yeah, so um, I'm, I can actually feel anyone who is listening to this going, okay, they're starting to already think about, all right, how does this work for my child? How does this work? So, um, let let's say that um, I'm gonna I'm gonna use me and right. I go back when Joseph was age appropriate for this, and I guess one of my curiosities is, does this work for every kid? Yes, and I that is a very brave statement for me to make, but if we think about it, <laughs> every kid needs to work on those skills, right? So I didn't have a learning difference. I went from a middle to lower socioeconomic environment, a huge public high school to a very um, hoity-toity New England college. Um, that was a huge adjustment. I wasn't prepared. So I wish somebody would have done this with me. I didn't have the same access, right? So it doesn't matter typical, atypical. These are essential skills across the board. It's just a little more complicated and a little more robust if you have a learning difference. We have to focus on things like does your, did your son understand his IEP goals? Does he understand his accommodations and modifications? Was he aware of the modifications that he had and how significant they were? Was he able to articulate his functional limitations? All of these things that they're gonna have to eventually do, were they really prepared? Did they understand general education requirements? Do they know what FERPA is and SAP? All these acronyms that nobody actually knows, but you have to know it. So a lot of these foundational skills are applicable to all, but are especially important to students with more complex learning needs who might require more critical evaluation of post-secondary environments that might not have been in the driver's seat um, as other students might be, and where parents are looking just for that next safe landing place. And unfortunately, families are more prone to be bamboozled by admissions. You're going to see the wonderful executive functioning coach. You're going to see the tutoring, but are you going to ask the right questions? Who's giving the tutoring? Do they know how to differentiate if you have dyslexia? Um, does a student really know how to do executive functioning coaching? You know, how consistent are the services? All of these little traps are what we try to prevent in Navigator Prep. Yeah, and are the parents, and I know we talked about transition being teamwork, do the parents participate in, in this program? Absolutely. So each month, the student works with a transition counselor in two individual sessions. The parent has their own individual session. So you actually have your own time to process through your thoughts and your questions, as well as your own feelings about the separation. This is a big deal for families, and we have to provide you the space to go through that. And then we have a student webinar and we have a family webinar. Um, that way we're providing ongoing and necessary psychoeducation around the transition. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, so you've worked at a college preparatory school for students with ASD or autism spectrum disorders. I'm curious how different was it from a school for neurotypical kids? And 
do you recommend kids on the spectrum to choose it over conventional school? That's a big question. Um, yes, it so is. It, it, you know, I think it really depends on access to services, quality of services in your area. But I will say the high school that I worked at was tremendous. It was the best teaching lesson that I could have ever learned and students were challenged. Um, we had a skill-based curriculum as a private school. We were able to be a little more creative with our approach um, and students felt safe to take risks. The caveat is being a school that catered specifically to students in that population group, you become a little desensitized to some more social quirks and problematic behavior. So you tend to normalize things that are going to be addressed later, might be problematic later, um, like social errors, or that's just Johnny, you know, one of those things that we would say. That could be a little bit of a problem. But I feel like if the educational environment in your, in your hometown is not adequate, yes, I would say fight for whatever service you can. As a college now, which is very rare two colleges in America that exclusively work with students who learn differently with ASD, ADHD, or other challenges. I would say this is the greatest environment I've ever worked in. Because what we tend to say is that your, your diagnosis gets you in the door. Our curriculum is no different. Our approach is different. How we teach you is different. It's really best practice. And students here feel included. They feel like they could lead and we understand them. And so often in college, you're working with so many people that it makes it really difficult to feel valued and understood. And that's what leads to attrition. So a place like Beacon where we're focused on the whole student, not just their brain is key. And that's why I think a place like this is necessary and hopefully more will come up in the next you know, 10 to 15 years. I agree with you. Um, it just um, sounds like a dream come true, honestly, um, because I, too, um, believe in uh, whether a child is disabled or not to teach to the whole child, because that that's what uh, teaching is. Oh. And so I, I love I love what you're saying. And I think any parent uh, who's listening to this is going to get extremely excited about it because, um, I, as you say, what, there's two two colleges now that yeah, do this? Colleges, you know, Beacon College, we're right outside of Orlando, Florida. There's a college in Vermont landmark that works with similar students. What I, what I love about the Beacon difference is that we look at holistic engagement. Most schools will monitor success rates by GPA. We're looking at, are you academically engaged? Are you socially engaged? And are you engaged with the community? If you do not see value or connectiveness, you're not gonna be successful. And a GPA doesn't tell you all of that. But to have professional resident directors, professional counseling staff, professional learning specialists that are constantly pushing students to become actualized, right? Become who they can be in society is the most rewarding thing in my entire career. Uh, yes, I love it. You have presented nationally and internationally on topics including systematic barriers in higher education for students with learning disabilities. What are the barriers? I think the primary barrier is the lack of focus on mental health. Um, mental health across the board is one of the leading causes of attrition. But for students who learn differently, the rate of comorbidity is so high and sometimes so overlooked, largely because of their age. When you're coming into college, that 18 to 24 age group, and you're being introduced to new stressors, you might be more prone to more significant psychiatric conditions that have never been touched before, either because you know, neurologically, they're not developed yet, or environmentally have been protected. So I think the largest barrier is the lack of access to adequate mental health in colleges, the lack of awareness around um, the impact of mental health, and the fact that we don't talk about it enough, that it's still pretty stigmatized. Outside of that, I think the next barrier is the weird, it's going to be technology. Students are so 
reliant on technology to help them function in their daily routine that they don't know how to function for themselves. You know, I still go, I'm old school, you know, give me a planner and I'm good. Um, but for students, they're relying on a lot of adults or a lot of technology to help them manage their day. And I think that is an overlooked problem that we're seeing. There's no conscious transition from school-based technological platforms to the next, right? So if you have Google Classroom in high school, well, your teacher is going to put in, you know, what your assignments are. You're going to get reminders. You're going to have backup materials if you've lost them. Well, then you go to college and every professor might be using a platform a different way. So you've never learned, and it could be a whole new platform, by the way. So you've actually never learned the, the skill. You've learned how to function based off of an environment. You don't actually master the skill of it within, within executive functioning. So I think those are the two big ones. Um, I also think finally, the last one is colleges operate in silos. It is a very uncollaborative environment. Disability services doesn't always coordinate with academic affairs. Residence life is in a different division than tutoring. So you're going from a student-centered model of high school to a siloed environment in college. And that's a really big issue that we're addressing at Beacon is can we be more collaborative, which we are. We implemented a whole new model for that reason. But when you look at those three things combined, mental health, self-reliance, and silos, it's going to lead to attrition for a more at-risk population. Yeah, those and those are, um, uh, and I agree with you, those are in, uh, big barriers and also important ones. And so um, how do you, how do you help the kids? You know, how, how do we how do we close these barriers? What, what do we do? The first thing is we have to go back further, right? So there are systemic barriers because in high school, most students in special ed are not being pushed to a college going culture. So they're you're they're not really engaging in the same kind of conversation or college counselors might not be aware of how to support a student to get accommodations in college. So I think number one is, is increasing education for high school professionals around the American with Disabilities Act um, and these more concrete transitions that are going to occur. Um, so I think that's part one. Part two is educating parents. You know, parents are still very much in the driver's seat. And it's still very, it's upsetting to me when I hear parents say, you know, my, my kid is 17, I want them to go to college, but on their IEP, it says that they are vocationally tracked. And then I asked some questions about their intellectual capacity, their social emotional skills. And I said, well, have you ever said that you would like your child to be tracked towards college and career? And they're like, no, I'm like, well, you know, you have the right to, to go into an IEP meeting and request changes. And so I feel like there's not enough coaching and advocacy with parents so that they know what they're fighting for and when they need to fight for things. Yeah. Um, and then finally, I think we need more programs that teach skills and less programs that teach concepts. College is, is not this general concept, right? So when we teach college readiness in high schools, you can't teach that if somebody's going to a, a small two-year college versus something that's going to a UCLA, right? It's not the same. And for students who struggle to generalize skills, to make the assumption that you could teach that college readiness skill and apply it to every environment is, is naive and it sets our students up for failure. Yes, uh, I agree. I agree with all of that. And so while we're talking about um, the, the whole child, these barriers and real life application, right? Um, I, I'm curious, you know, about transitioning then from, um, like we've, we've got them going on this college track or we're, we're moving, we've adjusted, we're doing great. And now we're looking at graduating from college yeah. and applying all this to the world, to their life, to, to jobs, workforce. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, what do you all, is there a transition program for that piece? Yeah. 
So it's interesting because the way you just described that transition is no different than the transition from high school to college, right? The yeah. earlier you start, the more support you get, the more you break it down into chunks, the less jarring it's going to be. Same thing has to happen. So what I like about Beacon's model, which I want, I would like more to see more colleges do this, is we do have a four-year career model. So there are certain courses you have to take each year. We require an internship to graduate. That is really critical. So you have to do 80 hours of an internship to earn a bachelor's degree at Beacon College. Um, we have specialists that really work with our students around resume development for the atypical brain. Part of what's difficult um, around the career transition is that most career counselors are also not aware of that ADA compliancy and how do you navigate that next step. And because if a student doesn't self-disclose, they wouldn't even know how to talk about it. So how do you create a resume with a student who's dyslexic? Who's going to do that? Um, these are questions that I would ask as part of the college evaluation process. You have to look long-term. Um, you have to ask these very key critical areas of how does your career service um, center collaborate with disability resources? Who's training our students on ADA compliancy and how to access accommodations in the workforce? Those are things that colleges should be doing. Those are things that careers should be doing at Beacon we're really fortunate because we're now partnering with different organizations to teach them how to become more neurodiverse friendly. When you look at a lot of corporations with equity and inclusion statements, neurodiversity may not even be part of it. So mm -hmm. how can we continue this civil right for our students, for our adults as they navigate the workforce? It's important to remember ADA is still really new. It's in our generation, it was established in the early 90s. That's not too long ago. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And just like what I'm saying in, in the high school sector is the same thing in the career world, education, training, and questioning. Yes, yes, because I I, I love this work too, because really this is a, a global, it is society, um, as we're discussing it, although we're applying it to post-secondary education, it really does do, does go much um, deeper and and bigger than education, you know. Wow. And and so we need to really work together um, as a society to help these these people be able to live these fulfilling lives that they deserve. Um, and to not stigmatize it, right? So, yeah. you know. It's it's interesting that, you know, if if you're not diagnosed also at a young age, getting these services later is also really difficult. So there, it, it is a huge systemic issue about access to appropriate, you know, diagnosticians, access to early interventions. Um, and unfortunately, it's an, an expensive model. And I would love society to do a little more work to support um, outreach and education for rural communities, for first-gen minority communities, because this is global. And like you said, we're not just talking about access for education. We're talking about access as a civil right as a person. Yes. Yes. And there's so much work to be done. So um, as I, as I coach parents, I'm, I'm like, you know, one of the, the, one of the pieces that I like to include working one-on-one -on -one with anybody is how can you pay it forward and give back? Absolutely. Right. And so this conversation right here, there, if, if you don't know where to give, if you don't know how to pay it forward, there is so much work that needs to be done. Yeah. And um, uh, I, I think this is a very important conversation and you and I should probably continue it. <laughs> That's a big piece of what we do at Beacon. It's so people ask me, why do we do consultations? Why are we providing? Why do we work with students going to any college? And my answer is because that's my mission. Yeah. It is not just about filling 500 beds at Beacon College. We could do that. We've done it. It's really about changing the space of higher education for students with learning differences. And I think paying it forward means not living in a box and not being selfish to our institution. It's working with Title I schools. It's working on free virtual educational models. It's certificate programs. It is access to education 
because the more people we support, the more our students will be successful. Yes, and it, and it changes really the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it really does. And this isn't a fact. It, it, is, it is something that I heard at the conference that you and I attended as a projection that half of all kids are going to be diagnosed on the autistic spectrum by 2025. Yeah. <laughs> so we have work to do. <laughs> it's, it's worldwide. I was, you know, I've done, I, we've done some work in the United Arab Emirates and take away the language. It's the same thing. You know, yeah. are the same. Our parents all have the same concerns. Education is still reacting to ongoing changes in the field. It's our job to be humble, one, um, to continue to collaborate, too, and to recognize that through collaboration, through ongoing learning, we can make changes. It doesn't take just a group of politicians to make changes. It takes a group of caregivers, and that's parents, educators community members and corporations. Yeah, I love this. Um, so moving forward, um, yes, lots of work to do. Um, but the good news is, is there is, there is improvement from the time um, my son now is 30, but he graduated in 2010. And there is um, so much improvement in post-secondary education and employment. So, you know, I, I want to acknowledge that there, there is growth. Absolutely. We, we do have a lot left to do. Um, I, I'm curious um, if, if you were, so this is kind of a fun question. I think if you were a king for a day, Day, what would you change in education to su support students on the spectrum? I would change the way students have access to accommodations. Um, right now, about 12 to 15 percent of students in college are receiving their accommodations, and that's things like extended time, notes provided, um, separate testing, things like that. And we often say it's because of stigma. Um, and to me, it is the system that we put in place to self-disclose, to self-advocate and, and utilize those accommodations. So if I could do anything, I would rip that whole process up. Um, oh, now I have another one. Oh, this is a good question. My second thing for King of the Day is I would change the policies around the role of parents. Um, so maybe not directly for the students, but I feel it's a really crazy model to go from a parent-driven educational system to one that is safeguarded through FERPA and that is pushes families away. I would want to figure out a new model to make the role of parents feel a little more appreciated and heard, especially in the transition. Yes, I, I love both of those things. And I'm pretty sure the parents listening to this are going, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it it is a bit of a um, frustrating, helpless feeling as a parent to, to go from one to, to one. And they're very opposite and extreme, right? Yeah, it is. And it's odd because, you know, obviously it goes back to families are not getting a lot of education around things like FERPA and HIPAA and conservatorships, things like that, um, yeah. which is what I'm doing my doctoral dissertation on simultaneously. So it's probably why I'm a little more passionate. But um, when you go to college, people think, oh, well, I, my child signed a FERPA waiver, so I have all of this access, and, and you don't. You have access to educational records, and every college determines their educational records and what can and cannot be disclosed. So it's really important for families to be aware of that and have a communication plan with their child because colleges are not going to be able to give you the robust data that you want. They're not going to tell you, did they go to the dining hall? Do they have friends? Are they safe? Are they happy? Are they healthy? It's just not the kind of thing that you do in college. And that is opposite. And you have to make that change, just like students, in two and a half months which is another reason why we have this Navigator Prep program is because we know it takes more than two months to make that kind of transition. Yeah, I love that. Yes, <laughs> I'm just like, yes, 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 yes. What is your advice for students on the spectrum that are pursuing higher education? Keep pursuing higher education. 
<laughs> Love it. Do not let people tell you no if you feel and you have the feedback that you can. Do not let them limit your options. I think that's a big piece. When I you talked about growth, right? When I started my career, there was like three options for students on the spectrum. You said them very specific places. And now the door is open. And now it's up to the, the student themselves to take advantage of that door, take the risk and move forward. So I would tell students to just keep pursuing it and pursuing it greatly and making sure that if the door is open to be comfortable walking through it. Great advice. That is great advice because I think um, so many of them don't feel like that, that they can. They certainly don't know how to. So as a parent, what is your advice for moms, parents raising children with autism? Do your homework. Um, I think what is so important for, for parents is do not get fooled by glossy brochures and a pretty website. Be the, be the critical thinker that you are, that you've always been. When you go to a college, ask the tough questions. Ask, walk me through what your retention rate is for students who learn differently. How do you support students holistically if they have social pragmatic issues? Um, how do your departments collaborate? Don't be afraid to be the parent that a lot of people have told you not to be. That's not helicopter parenting. That is parenting. That is good parenting. You are trying to ensure that your child, who is a child, by the way, a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, I don't care what anybody says, it's a child, that they're being launched into a safe place that will both protect and challenge them, um, but also push them to their actual ability. So just do your homework. Have that mom gut that asks those tough questions and don't be afraid to do it, even if your child says you're embarrassing them. You're allowed to embarrass them on a college tour. Yes, and and that is what happens a lot. I know for my son Joseph, he he just wanted to do everything on his own, and you know, so that that's a tough uh, tough transition too. Is when your your kids aren't always agreeing with you, but it doesn't matter because in essence, what you're doing is you're you're advocating. Yeah, and you're and you're really doing your research. You know, if your child is doing the college search process on their own, that's fantastic. But you get to do your college search process on your own too. <laughs> I always tell my staff that if a parent is asking you a lot of questions and if you're not feeling comfortable at answering them, um, either one, you need more training and we could do that, or two, this isn't the right fields for you. You should be okay with the hard questions because we're talking about the full student experience. I'm very well known here to say no child is worth a $50,000 traumatic experience. And so often college becomes a traumatizing experience because we didn't do our homework. And unfortunately, that still rests on the responsibility of the parent. So don't be afraid to be that person. Oh, I just love everything you're saying. It, it really does hit home um, from a parent and an educator's uh, viewpoint. Uh, wow, we've, we've discussed a lot. And honestly, I, I've got so much I want, more I want to ask you, but we can't do that today. So you'll have to come well, back. To. <laughs> Is there anything you would like to mention before we go? I just would love for you to know that if you would like to reach out to me, you can do that very easily, beaconcollege.edu slash Alex. You can schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me. If you would like to just learn a little more about our college readiness programs or general information around Beacon College and how we support students, please don't hesitate to visit us. It's very nice here in the winter. Um, we're right outside of Orlando, but just know that you have a place here that is supportive of you championing you. And uh, I'm just very privileged to be in this space and allowed to be a partner with, with parents um, of students who learn differently. Well, on behalf of um, all parents, thank you for the work you do. Um, most sincerely, thank you. Um, it is much needed. And I'm so happy to hear that there's somebody out there that is creating a atmosphere for our kids uh, where they can learn, become whole, and give to society um, their gifts. 
that um, I'm sure you're going to help them discover. So thank you on behalf of all of us. My pleasure. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode of A Mother's Guide Through Autism, please go ahead and like and, and subscribe because when you all do that, you help our message of knowledge, hope, and inspiration get out into the world. I'll see you in the next episode.